Arvada, Boulder, Golden, North Glen, Thornton, Westminster, Superior. Uh, we also have the League of Women Voters, the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum, and as you know, they're one of the sponsors here this weekend, the Rocky Flats Homesteaders, which is a retirees organization, and an individual named Nancy Newell. Um, our focus is on the post-closure management of Rocky Flats. We are what I would like to say a data-driven organization. We examine site data, uh, including quarterly monitoring results. We focus a great deal on groundwater um, and surface water quality and examine issues uh, um, that I know are important to people, such as how does plutonium move in the environment at Rocky Flats and how do you know? Our focus as local governments, we're more governments than we were initially back when we started in 1999 as a prior organization, but it has to do with trying to ensure that national decisions include local interests and priorities. Leroy, the first night, said that the governor, Governor Romer at the time, had a moral imperative to engage, and we use different language but the same idea, that as local governments, we're in charge of the health and safety and welfare of our community, and as part of that imperative, that means engaging on Rocky Flats, that means engaging to understand the issues and to voice our views as necessary. Personally, my work started in 1995. I was a staffer for Congressman David Skaggs when he um, was uh, the, the representative from this district. That work was a slew of things, um, including uh, funding for cleanup, uh, national security issues, worker safety issues, worker compensation issues. Excuse me. When David uh, retired from Congress, I then was hired to run an organization called the Rocky Flats Coalition of Local Governments. And our focus was cleanup and really paving the way to post-closure management of the site. We used the term long-term stewardship. And those were efforts that the coalition was very much engaged in as local governments, Citizens Advisory Board, which was an organization, um, a DOE-funded organization that was individuals representing various viewpoints that also engaged on those issues. Um, when that ended, when the, when the coalition ended, I took on the job at the Stewardship Council. And so collectively, I've been working on these issues since uh, 1995. Uh, in one capacity or the other as uh, staff or elected officials. Um, I want to, before I just, more broadly, um, let me just say one thing. It's, uh, my work in general is on environmental conservation issues. It's not something that most people in the Rocky Flats community who know me even consider that that's part of my work scope, but I do a lot of work with uh, nonprofit conservation organizations. I'm an attorney. Um, that work focuses on a lot of regulatory work, both compliance issues um, and also pressing for newer and stronger regulations. Um, as needed, we sue the federal government. We've had a couple in the last few years, a couple of lawsuits against the Department of the Interior, agency actions leading to lawsuits in the state of Utah. Um, so I see these issues from a very broad perspective because I juggle a number of different hats in my professional work. Uh, let me conclude by just saying one thing. I, I don't know if he's here or not, but um, yesterday John Lipsky in the sort of open, oh, there he is, opening session, he called out specifically the Stewardship Council, and I, I, I know I'm not going to get his words exactly right. I don't have that kind of memory. But in essence, what he said was that the Stewardship Council is the way government should work, and that is coming together as governments, working together to proactively address issues, working with the state, and working to understand what the impacts uh, and issues are. And I think he said we were funded for 60 years. I don't know if that would be a blessing or a curse to be funded for 60 years. <laughs> I certainly know that I wouldn't be around and, and we don't have that kind of funding. But nevertheless, I just wanted to acknowledge that his uh, generous thoughts on the importance and the value of an organization such as the one that I represent. David, Niels. Um. <clears throat> My name is Neil Schoenbeck. Um, I, uh, I retired from Metro State College um, a couple years ago and then uh, couldn't stay out of the classroom, so I'm now an adjunct professor at uh, both Regis University and UCD, University of Colorado, Denver. Uh, my field is biochemistry, and, um, that's, uh, and also, of course, I teach the, the chemistry classes that go along with that. My interest in biochemistry, um, my training is different from my ultimate interest, which is in aging. What are the causes of aging? 
Um, basically, it boils down to um, living. Uh, <laughs> uh, and more specifically, at a biochemical level, eating food. Um, and so um, that is, seems to be unavoidable. And the other is radiation, environmental radiation. Um, and so I, uh, I got interested in Rocky Flats. Well, not explicitly, but uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, I was a senior in high school at the, uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And um, that fixed my attention on nuclear weapons um, from then until who knows when. Um, at any rate, um, when I moved to Colorado, um, I wasn't aware of Rocky Flats. Um, I became aware of it, of course, and I met Ed Martell at uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research up until the point where I was actually working there and met him. Um, he wouldn't return my phone calls because I knew he knew something about radiation, ha having um, measured the plutonium offsite for the first time in, after the 69 fire. But uh, when I moved in right next to his office and he found out I was a biochemist, uh, he was trying to learn that stuff. And we then started a 10-year conversation where he taught me nuclear chemistry and uh, <clears throat> I told him what I knew about biochemistry. Um, since then, um, I was on um, several co um, councils, the Rocky Flats Environmental Monitoring Council starting in the late 80s, um, and then the Health Advisory Panel that went for almost 10 years, actually went longer than that, um, 1999 to 2001 or two, and several other advisory panels having to do with Rocky Flats. Um, I think they picked me because I, I bridged the gap between science and um, uh, the public. Uh, one of the, my favorite classes that I teach is uh, Science and Public Policy, Nuclear Dilemmas, which I've done for years. And uh, the focus, or I should say the main piece is Rocky Flats, um, the history of it. And um, I think the reason I'm on the panel today is probably because I was involved in the Citizens Environmental Sampling um, Project that uh, was part of the Health Advisory Panel where we uh, sampled, had citizens uh, pick places uh, to sample for plutonium offsite at Rocky Flats in the early 90s, and we presented our results in 1996. And the reason for that was because um, the public didn't trust um, the official uh, measurements, and uh, so we figured, well, let's go find out, um, have citizens pick the spots, have them pick the laboratory, have them analyze the data, and that's what we did. Um, and so it turns out, um, the results are pretty much uh, the same as what everybody else had done, which was very surprising. And uh, I'll have more to say about that later. Thanks. Carl Spring, I've been with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment for uh, just over 22 years now. Um, prior to that, I was uh, had a master's degree in geology and worked in exploration geology. Uh, uh, frankly, uh, more fun at times than being a regulator, but uh, uh, along with the EPA, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment is, uh, regulates Rocky Flats as it does other uh, contaminated sites in Colorado. So we have a responsibility to uh, maintain the public health and environment uh, for the citizens in, in this state. Um, so 22 years ago, that was 1992, and uh, so subsequent to the, the events that are being celebrated this weekend, uh, subsequent to the end of the production at Rocky Flats, and uh, kind of an interesting time when Rocky Flats was uh, moving on from a uh, one cleanup agreement to another. The first cleanup agreement, uh, when I first came there, uh, much of the time was spent uh, resetting milestones, regulatory milestones. Uh, nothing was getting, the environment wasn't getting cleaner, uh, not much was happening except meetings and deciding to uh, assess penalties. And, and uh, so the next uh, I watched as, and participated in the uh, cleanup agreement that was finally um, signed in 1996 that allowed a much more efficient process to, to take place, that allowed the site to be cleaned uh, more efficiently than had been done at any other site in the, in the country. Um, Seven and a half billion dollars later, 
um, uh, considerable change is, has happened. And those of you who have been, been able to see the site here since closure have, have been able to see what that site has, uh, has now become. And we'll talk about that uh, and what we know about the condition of the site today uh, here in the next hour or so. Um, one of the aspects of the cleanup that was interesting to me was the public participation. I have been in contact with state regulators at uh, many of the other DUE sites across the country, Department of Energy sites, and uh, listened to the process that they go through and how they deal with uh, stakeholders. And uh, stakeholders, our stakeholders here, included not only cities, uh, interested citizens, workers, uh, as well as uh, activists who had been involved for some time at Rocky Flats. And with that, uh, dealing with that group and including uh, stakeholders in the process, uh, at the time, I, I wondered uh, um, how efficient this process could be. We had meetings on top of meetings, endless meetings. And, um, uh, but when it was all over and done, I think uh, that process that included stakeholders in citizens' advisory boards, panels, focus groups, uh, as well as our, our required regulatory public meetings that we had. Uh, I think that process led to a, a better, better final decision. It uh, included input from the public, it challenged our decisions, and uh, we therefore had a, a better decision decisions uh, at the end of the day. So ultimately a more efficient process. Thank you. Scott? Yeah, he pretty much stole all my far. Because <laughs> we both got there at the same time. My name's Scott Sorovchak. I'm the DOE site manager for Rocky Flats. I also have our Pinellas County, Florida site and a few sites in Wyoming. And I did the same route as Carl. I went, started out in the oil field, ended up in Florida doing consulting, and ended up here in 1992 with pretty much the same exact experience that Carl described. Uh, the, the best part of the whole Rocky Flats closure project was the fact that we worked as a as a team, uh, not only DOE, CDPHE, and EPA, but also the local municipalities and the public. We had, like Carl said, a lot of, a lot of public interaction. It wasn't always fun, but we got a lot of good out of it, and I agree 100% with Carl that the end product because of that is much better than it would have been. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so we have uh, a, a map up on the screen, and um, let's start with a question about uh, what do we know about the results of the cleanup? Carl mentioned, uh, you know, agreement after agreement, finally settling on the 96 agreement. What do we know about the results of that cleanup, and how do we know it? So why don't we start with uh, Scott? Okay. Well, everything we know about that work is documented on our website in, within the administrative record, which is a uh, CERCLA collection of... CERCLA? Okay. I won't super use that fund, term. Superfund. <laughs> yes. Okay. Essentially Superfund. I'm, I'm the uh, jargon monitor here as well. <laughs> right. Even though it wasn't done by EPA, it was done by DOE. Um, so all that documentation, which includes everything that led up to the remedial investigation, feasibility study, the proposed plan, and ultimately the selection of the remedy is many, many, many volumes, and it's all available on our website. 
But the bottom line is, uh, as part of our public process, we selected soil cleanup levels. We called them soil action levels. And when we had the equipment at the site and it was available, which was the biggest part of the expense of doing the job, we took any amount of soil that it took to get well below that number. I think the, uh, the average concentration across the entire site is, what, Carl, about 1.2 peaks per gram, somewhere in that ball. Across park. the entire site, I think it's 3.2 in the central area, but right. one point something across the entire site. Right. Uh, so 3.2 3 and 1.2 what? Picocuries per gram. A picocurie is a thousandth of a gram. Uh, I'm sorry, thousandth of a curie. Picocurie. Right. Actually, no. a trillionth. A tr I'm trillionth. Sorry. Before I misspeak again, thank you, audience. Uh, a trillionth of a, of a picocurie per gram. Sorry. You know how it is in the government. We lose track of those decimal points. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that. That's really how the job was done. Uh, anything that was remaining underground, we determined to leave it in place when uh, removal of that material, whether it was concrete with uh, fixed contamination or whether it was uh, contaminated groundwater or it was uh, contaminated infrastructure like a pipe uh, we had the original process waste lines and the new process waste lines. Those kind of things, if we couldn't get at them because of uh, just the risk to the worker, then they were left in place with a minimum of six feet of fill on top of them. And truly, my job is to make sure that nobody digs into that kind of material even though, like I said, the contamination is fixed in place. So what we have left, like we were just saying, is uh, uh, surface conditions in my portion of the property, which you can see on this drawing up here. It's entitled the Central Operable Unit. It encompasses about 1,309 acres. We could have opened that to the public in, when the refuge was opened. In other words, I could have given that property to the fish for surface use, just like with the refuge, because it met the, the appropriate levels. But just because of the inherent problems with management of, of my portions of the remedy that I have to manage and maintain, it made more sense to differentiate the central operable unit from the uh, peripheral operable unit. What the remedy is, is institutional controls, which are controls that prevent excavation uh, unless they're required uh, to support the remedy, and uh, unauthorized access. Essentially, those are the institutional controls together with uh, use of groundwater and surface water, except for sampling purposes. That remedy also includes monitoring and maintenance as needed. So that, that is essentially our remedy in place. Uh, our job is to keep the contamination that's underground there and keep it away from people. Essentially, what we do is we protect the remedy that's in place from human uh, interaction. In other words, we protect the remedy from humans. So Scott, just uh, one, one quick question. Um, originally, in about the same time of the, the 96 agreement, the um, the estimate was that the cleanup of Rocky Flats was going to take decades and cost mm -hmm. more than $35 billion. Um, how did it go from that to uh, a decade and seven and a half billion dollars, and did that mean it was a dirty cleanup? No. The difference essentially was 
when we were an operating site, I got there, we were in resumption, which meant we were going to resume uh, production in 707 and building 559, which was the site laboratory. Once the determination was made that there was no further mission, then our, our ob objective for the future became much more clear. And the initial estimates were based on the normal funding cycle that we saw at Rocky Flats, which included, uh, out of our annual budget, most of that money was for simply keeping the lights on and keeping the HVAC systems to keep the buildings at a negative pressure, which meant you kept everything inside the buildings. It was extremely expensive to operate a nuclear facility. So come 1999, when we made the agreement with our, or at least we discussed this with our uh, congressional staff, we told them that if you could guarantee our funding on an annual basis, then we could finish this job by December of 2006. That was pretty much the deal. And the reason for that is, what would typically happen in an average year was uh, come September, October, we'd get all fired up and start working. We'd let contracts, we'd have remediation going, we'd have all the D and D work going inside the buildings, and then somebody across the uh, complex would slip on a banana peel, either Hanford or uh, Savannah River or somebody like that, and we'd get a call from the headquarters people saying we have to take a hundred million dollars from your budget and you know send it to these guys and when you operate that way and your mortgage cost is upwards of 350 to 450 million dollars a year you don't get much work done so getting the guaranteed funding of I believe it was 651 million dollars a year as part of the Closure Act, which declared Rocky Flats to be a closure project, that enabled us to really begin for the first time to plan out the project, soup to nuts, you know, schedule it, resource load that schedule. And I saw Miss Nancy Tor here earlier. Uh, she was the Kaiser Hill president, and they were the people that enabled us to meet that date, and actually we beat that date. Uh, I was handed the keys to Rocky Flats on October 13, 2005, which was a year and three months and $500 million ahead of schedule. So when you have a guaranteed funding like that, you can plan out work, you can execute work, and you don't have that problem of money disappearing and having to terminate work. Okay. So Carl, as um, the state with its responsibilities, what, what did you all do to oversee the cleanup and, and the results? And, and what did you, how did you determine that? Well, first of all, we were, uh, by agreement, uh, had a collaborative relationship with the uh, the uh, Department of Energy and uh, EPA, we, uh, uh, they didn't go off, uh, develop a decision and bring it to us. We were involved from the very beginning in developing those decisions. And that made the, the whole process much more efficient. One of, the, one of the several efficiencies that was realized during the, the cleanup process. Um, and there are some other regulatory efficiencies. Uh, Scott mentioned some. Another major one was that uh, as um, the process went on, there were, there were parts of the site that weren't as contaminated as expected. Uh, for instance, one major one was under building contamination. It was expected that uh, most of those buildings had uh, very high levels of contamination when they were, uh, during the characterization process, it was found that very few of them, there was very little contamination under buildings, and that saved 
a considerable amount of time and, and money in the process. Uh, our decisions were based as uh, the, the three of us, EPA, DOE, and, and CDPHE, uh, our regulatory decisions were based on an, an incredible amount of, of data. There may not be a site that is more characterized than Rocky Flats. There were something like six million data points that were involved from all media. I think it's uh, 1.3 million uh, soil, uh, surface soil samples among that six million data points. So an abundance of data uh, that allowed us to make uh, good, reasonable decisions. And as I said before, with plenty of input from other interested parties uh, along the way. So lot, uh, lots of data made for good decisions. Okay. And David, with the Stewardship Council, what was, what was the role of, of the council and local governments in this? We had the hard task of trying to convince these guys in the EPA to do more, to try to better meet some of our interests. Um, the thing we were most challenged by, this was during the days of the Rocky Flats Coalition, the predecessor to the Stewardship Council. The thing we were most concerned about was um, surface soils because that's the greatest pathway for water quality. And water quality became sort of the, for lack of a better way to put it, sort of the cause celeb for us. If you could protect water quality, you could really know that the cleanup would be effective. Um, and so we made that a priority. We made that a priority from a number of different angles. Um, and, but the primary thing was lowering what the surface water, or the surface uh, soil cleanup standard would be. There was an effort, uh, Nails was part of it, um, Mickey Harlow, who's here today, I don't know if Hank Stovall is here, it was a community-led effort, my old boss David Skaggs got the money for that, and it was designed to um, evaluate independently what are appropriate surface soil standards. Uh, we didn't get everything we wanted, we wanted them to do more in the subsurface, um, and that's why the robust monitoring that goes on today is so key, because that's an indicator of the effectiveness of the remedy. So we look at it from a groundwater perspective, we look at it from a surface water perspective, uh, and that's really the best way we can tell, even though we didn't get everything we wanted, we can tell whether or not the remedy is proving effective. Let me just say one more thing, because this, this came up the first night, I think Leroy mentioned it. You know, there was initially this idea that Rocky Flats was gonna take, uh, 30, I always mix up the numbers, 35, 37 years. billion, 70 years, $35 billion. A lot of that money was to leave the lights on. You know, the mortgage cost when Kaiser Hill came up, the mortgage cost of the terms for, what does it mean to just leave the lights on? That was about $400 million a year to do nothing, just to leave, keep everything protected and, you know, have security and, and um, uh, keep the stuff that was in solution safe and literally to leave the lights on. Um, I was a congressional staffer during those days and we all knew that those initial estimates, they weren't justifiable. They really weren't real numbers. And shortly thereafter, was some, those numbers came out of something called the BEAMER, the Baseline Environmental Management Report. And it was an annual report that the sites, or a periodic report that the sites had to give to uh, DOE headquarters, really sort of a congressional thing. And we knew those numbers weren't real. What happened then in, uh, and I'm gonna mix up exactly one, but it was early 1996, there was a new sort of head boss at the Department of Energy headquarters, a guy named Al Alm. And he started challenging all the sites to do it, to shorten that time frame because that wasn't financially feasible. And so Rocky Flats actually was the one that put together this first thing called a 10-year plan. What could you do in 10 years? And initially, it was gonna be 2010 was the initial cleanup date. And over time, sort of on the reasons that Carl talked about as they saw there was less contamination, as they also were able to streamline processes, they were able to expedite the cleanup. And part of the streamlining of processes was if you have a trailer out there that's a temporary office, you know it's clean. It just was brought out there in the last handful of years. You shouldn't have to go through a laborious process to demolish it and send it off site. And so there were efficiencies there as well. As well. Um, the thing that's interesting is that during this process, and this is something that doesn't get mentioned, 
is that as the timeline came down in terms of the number of years projected to clean up the site, and as the cost team came down, the surface standards for the clean up surface contamination also went down. There is this sort of idea out there, well, if it took less time and it cost less, therefore, they didn't do as much work. It just was the opposite. There was actually, we got, because of this oversight panel, we got a much better cleanup as measured by the top six feet of soil. That's really what you're most concerned about. And so it's something that's not well understood. It's, it's, it's confusing, and if I weren't up to my eyeballs in it for so many years, I would really understand the source of the confusion. And it's something you need to understand. It was a faster cleanup, but it doesn't mean it was a worse cleanup. We got better than we expected. Certainly when I started working on this in 1995, what we expected to get at that point, when these guys signed the regulatory agreements in 96, to where we ended up, it's a much better cleanup than we ever would have expected at that time. Okay. Um, many, many issues uh, getting raised here. Um, you mentioned surface water and monitoring, which is probably a good uh, segue into the, into the question of, you know, what do we know about off-site contamination? And uh, monitoring is something that we um, most recently remember from the uh, September floods, but there was also a 1995 flood. And uh, Niels, why don't you uh, talk about that, if you would? Um, yes. Well. Uh, what, what bring, comes to mind is um, a soil scientist, Iggy Latour, who was um, working out at the Rocky Flats site um, monitoring soil, a very sophisticated operation, three graduate students, um, and doing uh, basically whenever he uh, presented his work in public before 1995, he said, just leave the site alone. Um, plutonium stays put. It doesn't move. Um, and then uh, we had um, torrential rains in May 1995 to the point where um, the soil was soaked uh, from bedrock up to the surface and you had surface runoff. And in that, uh, Latour then uh, noticed in his studies that uh, plutonium moved. And the reason is, is that there was physical movement of particles to which the plutonium was attached. Um, and so it didn't migrate in the normal way you think about um, stuff that can that is soluble, but it was actually moved because of the rushing of the water, um, and the um, his project was ended, and it's uh, not clear to me who was responsible for that. But his story changed in 1995, and it was the wrong story, um, and that uh, that's my opinion. And uh, I wrote letters and stuff like that. But my, one of basically. Um, uh, what I'd love to see is, in addition to everything that we're doing right now, is to have a turn uh, Rocky Flats into a research park, not a recreation park. And the reason, <laughs> should I follow through on this or to wait till later? Um, <laughs> well, we can. Go. Why don't we come back to that? All let's right. let's stick for okay. a moment with the uh, with the yeah, monitoring. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I won't leave here until I get my point across. So that's okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Um, well, you can go ahead. Go ahead. And um, make the, it now then, and of course, we had this huge flood in September last year, um, and uh, I would love to know what happened on site. Um, and uh, you know, I don't think that uh, people are you know purposely keeping me from knowing about this. I just think that we are not set up for actually watching it, and that's what we need to do. Um, at any rate. Um, I, I just have a, a parenthetical comment, is, is that I was always amused by the word cleanup. Um, we didn't clean up Rocky Flats. We did a marvelous job at remediation, we, not I, but others. Um, but you know, <clears throat> when I'm assigned the job of cleaning up the kitchen, if I cleaned up the kitchen to the level compared to what it started with, that Rocky Flats was cleaned up, um, I would have made a bigger mess than what I had. I mean, it just makes no sense. So I think language is very important. I think it's important, even though remediation is a bigger word, it's much more accurate. We did not clean up Rocky Flats. It's not possible to do that. Um, I think I'll stop there. Okay.
Shall we start with the, the 95 flood in, in Iggy Latour? I don't know if Carl or, or Scott, do you, either of you know about uh, his research? Yeah, what research happened to and, Latour? How come he didn't continue? I can't answer that question. I don't, uh, don't know. He uh, went back to his native uh, country in Israel. Um, but I, I think most of the principles he was talking about there are um, already fairly well understood and subsequently by a panel of national experts that was put together called the Actinide Migration uh, Panel uh, examined the questions of how these radionuclides are um, travel in the in various environments, particularly in the soil at rock, specifically at Rocky Flats. That was a long, um, multi-year uh, effort. Uh, again, we had national and international experts that examined that, and by the time that uh, a national level was decided on for Rocky Flats, uh, as David said, a, a much lower number than originally in the original agreement. Uh, those, those, uh, the physics of transport of act actinides in the environment was well known, well studied and, and defined. Um, one other quick point about that, the, uh, the numbers, the much higher numbers that were in the original agreement were based on, on dose, and we won't go into the, uh, to explain the difference between dose and uh, activity here, but uh, that was done because EPA at the time was exploring uh, using dose as a as a standard for radionuclide cleanups or across the country. They abandoned that, went back to risk numbers the uh, the very next year. So we knew the year after the agreement was signed that uh, we'd have to revise, redo those those numbers and. Uh, so we not only had the new, uh, new regulatory guidance, we had uh, new information, both from the actinide migration panel uh, and other sources that, that led us to develop a, a new and ultimately uh, much smaller number that, uh, as David said, led to a, a much greater cleanup than had originally been anticipated by the, uh, the agreement. Uh, I'll let... Uh, Scott talked more about the September floods, the effort that was made, the heroic effort, frankly, that was made to, to monitor that event. Um, uh, the state's small role in that is to continue to, to uh, get split samples, that is, uh, take um, uh, a portion of the samples that have been collected to take to our labs to verify the numbers that DOE was getting from their labs. Uh, we did that, uh, we've done that uh, routinely, but uh, wanted to especially get a split sample from those floodwaters to, to verify what the, uh, what DUE's labs were saying. And we did that and came up with uh, uh, the, essentially the exact same number. Um, Scott, maybe you can talk to the results and how they came by that during, during the September floods. Okay. Yeah, essentially, we were like everybody else at the time the storm was coming in. We just thought it was going to be your typical storm. So we had our samplers configured as we normally do, and our samplers are what we call flow pace sampling. In other words, they're not, we don't just go out there once a month and grab a sample out of the stream as is the normal sampling process. Our samplers are full time. They're solar powered with battery backup and they pump a certain number of samples based on the flow conditions. So higher flow rates, we pump more samples into the sample container, which results in a better and more thorough characterization of the water quality at a specific location over a duration of time instead of just a point in time, which is typically, you know, in the afternoon, in the morning, depending on whenever our sampling crew can get the location, they would grab a sample. That's not the way we do it. 
in this event, essentially what happened was there was a big lag between the time the rain started falling and uh, the water levels rose. And, and as a matter of fact, they rose every night, uh, every night during the storm. Indiana Street was inundated, I think, two nights, two evenings. And one of those afternoons, I was out there at one of our samplers at Indiana Street, and it, it, was, it was very impressive. I've got a, about a 9,000-pound truck that, that's my personal rig, and I was out there because all of our other vehicles were in use. Uh, folks were out at the site. And at one point, I could feel the water pushing my truck downstream, and that's when I realized, I think I'd better get out of here. We had so much water at the site, we only got in those three days about, oh, anywhere from eight to 10 inches of rain. On the north end of the site, they received 18. So the conditions were well beyond what anybody could have ever expected, and, and we saw that certainly in Boulder. I believe uh, you had your house flooded or close to it. One of the guys that worked for me lost his house in, in that storm. So yeah, it, it was something that we couldn't plan for, we didn't expect, but what happened is we got the front end of that rising water, which we call the rising limb, which if you're after trying to determine is plutonium moving in the environment, that's what you want to look at. Because as, as Niels was saying, the primary mechanism for moving plutonium is mechanical. In other words, rain, hail beating the land surface, then sheet flow carrying those particles down gradient, downstream. So we got the rising limb in all cases until we actually had a rising limb in the form of a, of a cottonwood tree come along and rip something loose. We lost about uh, three of our sample points at any given time simply because there was so much debris in the flood. It, it, it broke our, our sample tubes away and it, it actually washed away one of our samplers. But soon after the water uh, went back to a more normal level, our folks could get out there and reconnect these tubes and then it got washed away the next night. So. We got samples throughout the storm, and essentially what we saw was we did see plutonium, but well below any standard, as we always see in, in Woman Creek and Walnut Creek. Could, Could I, I just add one quick yeah. thing? Neil, you, you asked, too. you sort of made the comments of, well, we want to know what happened, and um, I mean, that's correct, right? Everybody wants to know what happens. Um, so from the Stewardship Council perspective, we did a couple of things. We went and toured the site about three weeks after the flood to see what happened there. Um, then we were briefed on the, the, at our October 28th meeting. And so they gave us all the sampling data and, and extensive discussion about that. And then we discussed it again at our June, whatever the, this was, June 2nd meeting. Um, I don't expect everyone to be able to get to all those meetings. They're, you know, they're in the mornings, on a Monday morning. Um, but just a couple of things. The, 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 the reports that um, DOE develops are available on their website. Um, we provide links to those reports through our monthly updates, through our board packets. And you can opt in to our board distribution list. Just go to our website, Rocky Flats SC. So there's two S's at the end and then a C.org. Uh, and you can just fill out the form and an email pops into my inbox and you get added to the list. Uh, it's a great way to find out this kind of information because you know, the question that Nils is asking is very much the question that my governments and others want to know. You know. What happens and how do you know and what does it mean and should I be concerned and you know, all of those types of questions. So um, you know, we're, we're fortunate that what, we're, what we've seen so far you know, doesn't require any further action, that it doesn't require any alarm. 
Um, but that's something that, um, just so you all know, there's at least 10 governments and uh, some, some citizen organizations that are paying attention to this on a regular basis. Yes. A uh, <clears throat> couple points. Uh, first of all, we mentioned the standard. Let me, let me just quickly uh, mention the surface water standard. We, the state is concerned about surface water mainly because that is the, the one environmental route off-site that uh, we're mostly concerned about. Um, that standard, we, we are the only state with the promulgated plutonium in water standard. And when that was developed back in the mid-90s, um, it was a, a very conservatively calculated number, and that number is 0.15 picocuries per liter. So 0.15 of a thousandth of a picocurie, or of a curie per liter. Um, and that is one hundredth of the national drinking water standard. Uh, cities surrounding cities and their, their uh, water treatment facilities have to treat, have to make sure their water is uh, at 15 picocuries or below uh, for alpha radiation. And so this is a significantly smaller number that Rocky Flats is held to. Uh, one other point we, uh, that we at the state are interested in is because it comes up more, more and more frequently lately because of development around Rocky Flats, and that is what levels uh, are in the soil off-site of Rocky Flats. That was the subject of one of the, the studies done at Rocky Flats that led to a decision for the off-site areas. Uh, there were numerous other studies, and I, uh, a year or two ago, looked at all those those samples that have been taken off-site, uh, mostly north, east, and south of the site, and looked at what those levels indicated. Um, the main source of those of that characterization data was from what we call Operable Unit 3, that is the off-site areas. It was, was done for the site back in the mid-90s. Uh, another source at the same time. Can you show that slide? Uh, sure. Uh, this is the result of in that Operable Unit 3 report. It's a big three-volume port that's, report that's also available on DOE's administrative record. Um, you probably can't see the, the lines here that uh, represent lines of equal radioactivity, but you can see that uh, it does trace uh, levels of radioactivity above background off-site, particularly immediately east of the site, immediately east of what used to be the, the east gate of Rocky Flats. Um, Niels mentioned the, an, another source, and that was the citizen sampling effort that was done at the same time this was going on that verified these, uh, came up with essentially the same numbers that, that had been uh, already um, developed. Those numbers, for those of you who live near Rocky Flats, uh, south of Rocky Flats it is in the Candelas area, and these are numbers within a mile of, of the boundary of, of the, uh, ref what's now the refuge. There are 77 samples in that area, uh, a mile south of the site. The average concentration there is 0 0.05 picocuries per gram, um, and the high, highest con concentration is uh, 0.27 picocuries per gram. Very, very low numbers. Uh, that's essentially background of the average. North of Rocky Flats, the Boulder Broomfield Superior area, uh, there are 12, 12 samples up there. Uh, the average concentration is 0 0.04, again, at, at background. East of Rocky Flats, that's uh, because of prevailing winds and uh, other uh, and stream direction. Um, that was the most heavily sampled. There were 120 samples taken within a, a mile east of Rocky Flats. There, the average concentration is 0.72 picocuries per gram. Uh, again, we, the area offsite is well characterized as well. We have lots of samples. And uh, the conclusion there is that there, um, those are negligible levels and uh, uh, for the state, we would say 
there is no concern for the public health and environment. Okay. okay. Uh, Niels, did you want to say anything about the sampling? But I also want to ask about the Jefferson Parkway and, and the question of resuspension of, uh, of plutonium if indeed uh, the parkway is built. So maybe you can deal with both of those? Yeah. Um, well, I just want to comment on the, on the notion that, you know, negligible levels. Um, we can look at, all of us who um, have some kind of interest in this, look at a number and uh, draw completely different conclusions. And I think it depends upon uh, where you come from uh, and maybe even family of origin. You know, how we, where our attitudes come from, our opinions come from. Um, is uh, you know, still uh, a subject for social scientists to figure out. Um, I've been amazed at uh, how we can argue about things. You know, science give us, gives us the numbers and then we as humans interpret the results. And I think um, one of the problems is, is that we don't trust each other. Um, and then we, uh, you know, devolve into our uh, camps of opinion and then argue and don't get anywhere. So. Um, I think a lot of efforts have been made to uh, overcome this, but uh, as I, I said in on one panel, and you know, we still do the same thing after all these years, and, and for good reason, I think. Is, uh, um, but I, I'll leave that for the moment and get back to the subject, um, and that is uh, the Jefferson Parkway. Um, I think uh, it's still held up by some, um, but it's, it's probably gonna go through, I imagine. Um, the, my concern is is that um, again we don't you know when we the, the monitoring is you know the, the numbers are not bad uh, background of plutonium is uh, in the front range is between 0 0.01 and 0 0.1 and so the numbers you've just heard 0 0.04 0 0.72 you know they're not too far from 0 0.27 0 0.05 um, <clears throat> and there is one thing that that I'd like to hear from the people who are doing this on an ongoing, you know, daily basis, and that is that there was a study done about uh, burrowing animals um, on, uh, that are out there that go down to 16 to 20 feet, and they are constantly uh, bringing stuff up. So if you leave stuff on the site, uh, anything below six feet, or you have a six feet of cover, um, we have an ongoing uh, process where you buy, you bring stuff up to the surface. That's why I'm very interested in, in what the sampling um, system is. Uh, you've mentioned water. Um, I would imagine that uh, one of the most important um, pathways is air, is resuspension, and uh, respiration, bringing it into the lungs is the most dangerous. Drinking water isn't quite, it doesn't come close to that in terms of the health effects. Um, so I would love to watch the animals bring this stuff up. Do we know how much is down there? Um, well, you know, uh, there's uh, the missing an unaccounted for amount of plutonium. Most of it's probably in Idaho, um, as we, you know, the, the, the waste, but we just don't know what's underneath. So I go back to let's watch it carefully. And um, so do we have air monitors? And uh, are you concerned about uh, the burrowing animals bring stuff up because they're not going to be just off site. They're going to be in the, you know, central operating uh, unit, operational unit, also right there in the 360 some acres where you actually had the buildings. Um, so I would love to hear what you thought, think about that. I mean, it's just, you know, is it a concern or not? It's a concern that was considered during the development of uh, both the action levels and, and the final decisions at the site. We consulted with the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service uh, about burying, uh, burying animals and their ability to bring things to the surface. And so that, uh, that did enter into the decision-making process. There were, so we monitor any burrowing animals on site. Um, they are monitored carefully, closely. At the time of closure, there was a small colony, in the southwest portion of the, of the refuge, and uh, within a few months, I think, of closure, you know, wiped out by plague, um, which, which happens frequently to prairie dog colonies. Uh, they're monitored as part of the regular monitoring that goes on to, uh, uh, to, see, the, um, to see, what, uh, uh, see where those colonies get developed. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, as part of their conservation plan for the refuge, 
also monitor and have uh, designed into their plan uh, limits for um, any burrowing animals, including prairie dogs. Um, as far as their ability to bring what, what's in the subsurface, the contamination that uh, I think Scott mentioned, uh, this is uh, uh, radioactive particles that are entrained in uh, basement slabs and foundations that are buried at depth. Uh, any animals that encounter that concrete, uh, that's, uh, it's not accessible to those, those animals. So th that's the buried contamination that, we're, that Scott was referring to. That, and, and that we, is also part of our legacy management agreement is to make sure that those structures, uh, any of those structures remain at depth. David, did you? I just wanted to uh, add one thing, this whole thing of, you know, point oh four and all this. I mean, that can be kind of confusing, I would imagine, because you're trying to figure out, well, a little bit above grant background, does it make a difference, and how do we know? And, and at least that, you know, as I talk about these issues with my wife, I'm sort of challenged to try to explain this in a way that is understandable and there's some context to it. So I wanted to toss out one bit of context to place on this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there was um, an effort, my old boss David Skaggs got it funded to have a community oversight panel that was in charge of hiring independent consultants to do an evaluation of what are appropriate soil surface, con or soil contamination at Rocky Flats because the numbers that initially came out were, you know, the community was aghast at them. And so um, Nils was part of this project. Mickey Harlow is here. I don't know. It's hard, a little hard to see with these, these lights. Who else is here if anybody else was on that panel? But here's the thing they came up with. They said, well, let's assume that there's ultimately a family living on the site. And they're, we're going to call them the resident rancher scenario. And they're a family that lives there full time. They get all their food and their water on the site. They have kids. Um, and they did modeling, and this is all on website, you can go and see all this stuff, uh, assumptions about inhalation rates, you know, there's a fire and the, you, 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 the, the ground cover doesn't come back quickly, um, they're sitting there and in the streams and they're drinking water, so all of these things, you know, think of a little kid just out there on land and eating all this food and stuff. And, and they said, let's also on this scenario, let's make it protective to the, the most stringent um, part of the EPA's risk range so that your individual risk would be one in a million. It's called 10 to the minus six. So we have a ranching family, all their food, water, and vegetables out there, inhalation rates, ingestion rates. I mean, this was a thorough study. And they came back and said, Leroy was on this as well, he'll remember this, came back and said, well, the number should be 35 picocuries per gram for plutonium. So. That was a huge drop. I remember the, the meeting in Broomfield that night, you know, when they endorsed this. I see Mickey shaking her head here. I mean, talk about upset DOE folks, upset Kaiser Hill folks, upset EPA and state health. They were not pleased with this. Why is it important? Because the lands that comprise the refuge, the lands you're talking about off-site, are significantly lower. We're talking about 35 was protective for this ranching family. This is why I have confidence, because when I see an independent study that, when I see an independent study that is made up of community members, they can pick their own scientists, and they come up with this number, you have to have some context for this, and for me, as I advise my board, this is something that I turn to. This is something that I look at. This is something that I place value in because it, it's not the regulators. It was a community-led effort, and there was a lot of smart people involved in this. So I just wanted to flag that because I think that's a context um, for people to keep in mind as they look at some of these refuge issues and off-site issues. Um, can I add I just something? got a little, uh, actually, let's, well, just something real quickly. Yes, yeah, this yeah. will be real quick. Okay. When, when that happened, and uh, you know, here I am, a lowly staffer with a, a bunch of the Kaiser Hill risk guys who were at that point looking at all these various numbers, and when the senior managers walked in after that meeting to us and they said, okay, what's the difference between 650 
what was it, 657? 651. Yeah, 651 and, and 50. And we said, you know, we looked at them like, what do you mean? And they said, well, if we move the number to 50, what does that mean? And we said, well, for the most part, it just means you take a six inch lift in the areas where you need to remediate. And they looked at us, is that all? Yeah, and, and these numbers you see up here are pre-cleanup, pre-remediation. So that's really what it meant because most of the plutonium that we characterized were, was in the upper one to two inches of soil. So it just meant you took a lift in those areas and you were done. You were essentially at background. Okay. Um before this uh, little um, love note came up, it's actually um, a reminder of the Q&A, which I was going to turn to after asking Niels to uh, talk about his idea of the research park uh, for Rocky Flats. And since this is the last panel of the day, um, we can run long. So um, uh, Philip will eventually come and say when, uh, when the reception has to begin, but... Uh, We'll, we'll run a little bit longer, but let's first hear from Niels and his expand on your idea of the research park. Um, well, basically, you know, uh, if you were to set up an experiment to see um, how plutonium would move in the environment, you, w you wouldn't do on purpose what actually happened. Um, but given that we have this um, environment, uh, it just seems like an, a golden opportunity for learning more than we know now. Um, about uh, how plutonium moves. And, um, you know, after listening to the two folks on my left here, I think I'm going to go back and look at, uh, find out in detail what exactly is being looked at and what uh, would, you know, what other information we would like to see. Um, the, uh, I don't know about, um, I don't think we can control uh, burrowing animals as, uh, you, know, uh, you know, they repopulate and it isn't just prairie dogs. Um, and I immediately had a question, and it's a legitimate one, is, is that is the plutonium that is below six feet, is it all attached to concrete or is how much of it is available uh, to excavation by these animals? Um, at any rate, I mean, it isn't just for the health of the people right here in Colorado. It's for our understanding uh, for the planet because there are other places where plutonium is in the environment. And it, wouldn't it be a service um, to actually have this place where we're not going to build houses on the plant um, is to uh, put some effort into instead of creating a recreation area, but to create a research park. And then uh, not just to have the experts come in and tell us what we uh, need to find out or what can be done, but to have, um, you know, my experience with the sampling was to invite citizens to come in and decide where to, where to sample. And I found that a, a very um, encouraging project that we did. Um, it, uh, and I would recommend that, again, if this were ever to come out, you say, well, where's the money gonna come from? And I always uh, figure, well, as soon as you start talking about money, it's just a euphemism for what is your priority. Um, and so when somebody asks me, well, why, you know, when I say I don't have time for that, that, that doesn't mean that uh, I haven't made choices about what to put my time into. And so the question is, uh, is this a worthwhile thing to do? Um, and to have input from more than just the people who are educated in plutonium, um, but to have everyone who is in the environment, who lives here, participate in that and to create a research project. Um, that would be interesting to me. Thank you. Um, we'll now move to the uh, to Q&A. There are two ushers with microphones. Please uh, raise your hand and a mic will be brought to you. So this gentleman in the uh, center aisle here is gonna give Jake his exercise to get to you. And again, you know, please, uh, you know, no, no long statements. 
you know, try to keep it to, you know, a minute or two uh, and with a question mark at the end. Yes, sir. Rocky Flats is an alluvial plain that was built up by junk coming down the canyon. Uh, it has built up over geological time. Uh, it actually built up high enough that it's diverted the water that comes out of that canyon over towards the north. I guess my question, since you've asked me to be brief, is uh, uh, if, if indeed we see something like a big Thompson flood coming down out of that canyon, all you've got is just rubble that's sitting there to be washed away. Uh, is this six foot over cover uh, been considered adequate for such an activity? Um, we experienced uh, various estimates of, of what this last year's flood represented, but uh, it's a, at least a hundred year flood if we put it in that terms. In those terms, but uh, probably much closer to a thousand year flood event. Um, the environment, uh, the personnel, uh, the monitoring systems were all tested during, uh, during that week back in September. And um, I think we saw what the potential for what nature can, can do there. And, um, uh, you know, the, the site and its monitoring systems and the personnel, uh, I think, stood the test. Right here? In the, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Jake. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, just to uh, add a little detail there to the uh, burrowing animal study that was by Dr. Sean Smallwood, and he spoke of 16 species of burrowing animals. And I think that, you know, not only would they be bringing contaminants um, to the above ground environment, but themselves the possibility of being contaminated and moving off site. Um, my question is for um, Carl and Scott. Uh, Scott, you said that when um, we determined to uh, leave certain items in place. Uh, if we couldn't get at them, we buried them six feet under. I am specifically concerned about the infinity rooms and also yesterday, John Lipsky talked about there being four reactors at the Rocky Flats site. Um, I've been a person following this issue for many years and I never knew that there were reactors at the site. So if you could please characterize what happened with the infinity room specifically and shed any light on those four reactors that were mentioned yesterday. Thank you. Sure, yeah. The infinity room that she refers to was in building 771. And that room together with the entire, in, all the internal parts of 771 was removed. And disposed of off-site. So it's, it's not there anymore. Uh, the other part, the four react, pardon? I'm not sure, it would probably EnviroCare, because most of... Which is in Utah. Right, uh, it's now called Energy Solutions. Uh, most of our waste was very difficult to characterize. And, not only was it difficult, it was very expensive and time consuming. So in most cases, we chose the most conservative route, which was to consider it low level mixed waste, because that's what it would, have, would be if, if uh, we could fully characterize it. We could characterize it from a ra radiological perspective, but to de determine whether it was hazardous, well, concrete has a lot of metals in it and uranium, it's always gonna come up hazardous if you characterize it. The other question, yeah, I wasn't aware of four reactors either because what we actually called them were test cells. Uh, the best I can determine, they were probably the test cells in building 886. And what we did there was uh, run very, very, small scale uranium criticality experiments. And those things were also removed and disposed of offsite.
together with uh, the entire building. Where they were disposed? Yes. Well, I don't right now, but I could certainly research the records and, and tell you. There were 14 locations where Rocky Flats material went. Everything from municipal landfill to the waste isolation pilot plant down in New Mexico. There was special nuclear materials that were sent to Savannah River, and if you've seen the there's a battle over the MOX facility at Savannah River. That's very much a Rocky Flats a issue, which is a mixed oxide, and it has to do with nuclear disarmament in Russia and all these things. Um, so, you know, there was, it went 14 different places. Okay, question down here. Um, right here. I've right. got the mic. <laughs> Who has the mic? She does. I, I, uh, Oh, you have a mic already? I have the mic. Well, yeah. I get to choose, but go ahead. <laughs> Please. <laughs> two, two things. I just, we've got a child back here someplace, and it reminded me that this is important for us, but it's also important for the future generations of this country. So it's a good reminder that this is important stuff we're talking about. The second thing is, uh, I live, or have a condo over by Stanley Lake. And I remember going to Rocky Flats meetings years ago, and they talked about plutonium but in Stanley Lake, but it was in the sediment, so we didn't need to worry about it because it was in the sediment. My concern comes, Colorado doesn't always have floods. We have a lot of droughts, and I watched the water recede, and parts of that Stanley Lake that were always underwater were all of a sudden visible from the shore. Does anybody ever do testing on the sediment there? And with our winds coming from Rocky Flats, does that resuspend the plutonium that's in the sediment? And, and do we have, we may have flood processes that we think about, but do we think about how we handle things in terms of drought? And Colorado is a dry place. You know, um, it's an important question you're raising. There, um, back in 1996, the hydrological connection between Rocky Flats and Stanley Lake was severed. There's something called the Stanley Lake Protection Project, the Woman Creek Reservoir. Um, I don't know about Stanley Lake per se in terms of your drought question, but during that same time, Great Western Reservoir, which also has um, some contaminants in the sediment, did go dry. And the question was posed to the city and county of Broomfield, which owns and operates that, that reservoir there of, okay, now this stuff is on the surface, what are you thinking? And um, they made the determination that, that it wasn't warranted, it wasn't necessary. Uh, I don't know if the owners, if the same situation were to present itself on Stanley Lake, whether or not Farmer's Ditch and Westminster and Thornton and North Glen would reach the same conclusion. Um, but those ultimately become local jurisdictional questions, not the question uh, the federal government. It, it no longer is a Rocky Flats issue, no longer a federal issue. Carl? But uh, the question of sediments is a, a good one. It was uh, on the list of things to characterize during this offsite study that I mentioned earlier. And at three reservoirs, Maurer, Great Western Reservoir, and Stanley Lake, lots of sediment samples were taken. Uh, Previously, just previously, the USGS, US Geological Survey had done lots of sampling, and that data was included. Uh, along the shorelines the, of Great Western Reservoir and Stanley Lake, uh, samples were, where things had dried out, some samples were taken. In fact, to get enough, they, they did not only uh, sediment samples, but uh, wind tunnel samples to see what could be resuspended. To get enough, uh, to get enough uh, material suspended with those wind tunnels, they raked, they drove over the sediments along the shoreline to get it broken up enough that they could, they could get uh, sufficient sampling. And those were measured against the scenario, exposure scenario of a family living on those sediments. So should they go dry uh, somehow in the future? Um, 
uh, Great Western Reservoir is subdivided, uh, that's the scenario that was, was used to characterize those samples. Okay. And, oh, huh. <laughs> <laughs> the, the answer is they're well below 10 to the minus 6, that, that um, standard that uh, we use everywhere in the country. It's the low end of the risk range, uh, one in a million risk. The, again, excess of excess cancer. Um, that's an excess of the, the risk that we all have of cancer. Here in this room, we, uh, all of us, uh, the women have about a one in three risk of contracting cancer in their lifetime, the men about one in two. And so in addition to that, when we talk about one in a million risk, uh, that's point, point 0.3 for the women, zero, 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 one additional risk. That, uh, that's what we're talking about in terms of excess cancer risk. Niels, did you have something you wanted to Oh, just that John Lewski wanted to say. Oh, okay, okay, I guess it's mine. You, you get to be next, John. Okay. Yes. I want to thank you for at least having one scientist on the panel. I think this is a science issue and a health issue and should be such discussed. And I, want, I have a comment and I have a question to Scott. My comment is that in 2002, I was on the Citizens Advisory Board. At that point, I met with Professor Iggy Littar. He was back here visiting. What he said was that in 95, when he was on a contract to DOE, he found, because of the enormous amount of water, that so much plutonium, which is, co which is, col which is carried by the colloids in the water, came down that he and his equipment was hot, you know. He reported that, that and he was fired by DOE. He said it, he wanted to publish his findings. DOE didn't let him use any of his material. It took him years to get over that. I just want to make that clear, because he's not the only scientist who had findings like this and who had never been hired again. Professor Harvey Nichols found an enormous amount of plutonium captured by a snowfall. He never had another contract. Dr. Um, uh, Johnson, who was the health department director for Jeffco, was also fired. Now my question to, uh, to Scott is simply, how could you say that you could have released the entire site? When the EPA makes that decision and the operating unit number one, which is the old industrial part, is still a super fund, a national priorities list site and cannot be released. And I do hope that you'll keep the whole site closed so that people cannot go you know, the wildlife refuge is actually a donut. Now, the middle of the donut is the Superfund side, the most polluted side. And with everybody else, I hope that the, that the uh, public will never be allowed to recreate on that side. Thank you. Okay, I, I think the answer, the short answer is you're correct, it would have, it had to been done in conjunction with Carl and his EPA uh, counterparts. But I would have proposed that. I, well, at the time it would have been uh, environmental management together with myself, would have proposed, could have proposed that as part of the remedy. <clears throat> because the surface of the central operable unit does meet that criteria from a risk perspective. But once again, it, it just leads to management problems for me, having people wandering around playing with my monitoring stuff, and uh, we didn't want to deal with that. Okay, so uh, John, and I hope you're going to uh, clarify your four reactor comment as well as whatever else you're going to say. Well, I have a, I have a question for Scott and Carl. And first, I would like to make a clarification that anything that Mr. Abelson says or, mis or says about what I reportedly said is reckless and was wrong. And my question is about the MARSOM independent verification that was conducted in the 2000s. And I know that there were two contracts with Kaiser Hill, and MARSOM was in effect before the second contract. But specifically, the independent verifications found some hot spots. Kaiser Hill didn't properly calibrate their equipment. The bottom line, how were those hot spots and any other issues taken care of? The, uh, 
Marsum independent verification was also for the buildings, but that we also did it on soils. And it wasn't that Kaiser Hill's equipment wasn't calibrated, it's that these people sampled a portion that we hadn't. And when we got those results, we remediated them. We went out and removed soils. That was toward the end of the project, and I forget how many loca you remember how many locations that was? I think it was three or four, a handful <coughs> of locations. So we removed that soil. Uh, the inside the building work, that just meant we went back and scabbled. And scabbling is essentially you use a floor sander on concrete and you remove a, a very thin layer of concrete and then you resurvey it. And what we would try to do was would to get these buildings down to free release like we did with building 881 and several of the other buildings. Uh, some of the buildings like 776, 777, 371, uh, it was just too difficult to get down to that free release, uh, too time consuming. Essentially what we did is we just tore those buildings apart, threw them in rail cars and shipped them to Idaho or uh, Utah. <coughs> Uh, just, just a point of clarification, John, um, as this other questioner pointed out, and I have in my notes, you did say that there were four reactors at Rocky Flats in an imploded building. So I don't know where your comment about David Abelson comes from. He was talking about no, it was the uh, comment that Mr. Abelson made that I supposedly said that the Rocky Flats Stewardship Council was a good thing. <laughs> or FBI or break. break. I just want to clarify that what I said about this, the, uh, the stewardship council, um, people can listen to what I said when the video comes out. So it was, re and it was reckless, respectfully, it was reckless, reckless. As far as the reactors, the four reactors, I know the two names are horizontal and vertical. And uh, actually, it's from a DOE report. Um, and I've looked at that report, and I sent the sand for I wasn't done. And the, uh, uh, they were in 886, I think rooms 100, 101, and 102. Mm -hmm. And they did give off gamma radiation. And I believe it's high, it's uh, urinal nitrate, mm -hmm. which I've never heard of before. It was a solution. Right? A solution. OK, well, we're getting off track, but uh, <laughs> OK. Um, let's, uh, let's go to this side. Okay, we have. Uh, I can just, I've got a lot of points. Um, anyway, I am an authorized rep, so I speak to a lot of workers, and I've dealt with the criticality lab, um, people who worked in the criticality lab and were sometimes daily doing criticality experiments using the urineal nitrate from the tanks that were connected to room 101, 102, 103. There were pipes that were piping in uranium nitrate, highly enriched uranium, that had all the exotic, or not exotic, it had the daughter products of highly enriched uranium in that substance. Criticality um, experiments were happening, and during those experiments, strontium, cesium, yttrium, all of those things were being developed. For a long time, people were saying there were criticalities on site. And DOE was saying, no, the strontium that was found on site came from fallout from the Nevada test site. As it turns out, I've discussed this issue with people who were in the criticality lab. And they said they were creating strontium, cesium, yttrium. It was going through the pipes. The pipes were leaking sometimes, going back to the uranium nitrate tanks. And it was, um, Oh, what I'm most concerned about is we're always speaking about plutonium, but the exotic radionuclides are not discussed. Are they tested for? Niels had asked a direct question about air monitoring, which is not being done at the site, I was told by legacy management. 
Um, and I want to know more about the exotic radionuclides and also the daughter products of the highly enriched uranium that was on site. And the other statement is NIOSH has admitted that until 1983, they cannot reconstruct the dose to workers on site for neptunium, thorium, and U-233. We need to ask, are they looking for those radionuclides? Not just plutonium. That may be the carrot they're having us all chase. Let's okay. take a look at the other radionuclides on site. So the question is, are, are there, is there monitoring for other radionuclides? There has been in the past those that list, but uh, generally the sampling uh, protocol is quickly focused on the the um, radionuclides of greatest concern. That is americium, plutonium, uh, and uranium isotopes. But the, the others have been sampled for in the environment. I'm I'm not sure about in in buildings, but again, the buildings are now and their contents are now entirely gone. But uh, in the environment, there were, there were some limited sampling for those other they exotic. Okay, let's have a couple more questions before we move on. Ken? Uh, my name is Ken Freeberg, and I was the one that followed the special projects that used uranium-233, the neptunium, the curium, and et cetera. Those items were specifically sampled for. The buildings were cleaned up after that small projects were completed. There was uh, six cells, in fact, down in 771 building where some of that went for final disposal and getting rid of. But the people were sampled, and the area was sampled for both air, and gamma and neutrons, et cetera. That was accomplished in the 60s, primarily in the 70s. Okay. You're not getting to ask a question just because you passed me this note, Judith. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, thanks for all this whole weekend. Thank you, and thanks, Mr. Philip Sneed. I, I want to say two quick things. I mean, they're very quick, and then ask a question. <clears throat> I wish that all that money saved that you seem to be so excited about could have gone to health studies, both for the workers and off-site, like they did at Fernald, and that it would have gone for treatment for all these workers. And it's just so painful to hear all of the struggles for year after year that these workers cannot get their compensation, loads of them. And then I want to say, sampling methods differ. And, and when, when you talk about, oh, so many samples, so well characterized, it's, if, if uh, I'm a nuclear guardian, we have that at, Rocky, at the Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center, and we um, hired people to test for dust along Indiana two years ago and found and took 40 samples and found plutonium. And now we have bought a safe cast Geiger counter um, and which we're using all along Indiana at the dog park and, and at other sites around the plant. And, and, and it seems sad to me that, that these little citizens, I mean, some of us are pretty big, but <laughs> uh, it, that it's up to us to really try and characterize what's going on and what has happened after the flood. So, uh, oh, can I just say one quick thing? That, that the concrete that you talk about that is so important ha had better be good concrete for 24,000 years. So you could turn any of that into a question. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I, I think that's your responsibility for, for the question. Um, you know, we're, we're coming to an end here, and I'd like to, um, you know, just ask each of the, um, of the panelists to, you know, make a summary statement if they would like um, on this issue of, of contamination. Obviously, we just barely touched the surface of, um, of these issues. Um, so, 
let it let it roll. Um, Scott? Yeah, I I think all I can really say is that all of us that are out at Rocky Flats on a daily basis have families. We live in the community, and we wouldn't do that if we thought it was unsafe. Just real quickly, um, Rocky Flats was cleaned up to, to levels that are um, conservative at any site throughout the, the country. Uh, uh, more characterization, more um, lower levels of risk uh, remain there, and uh, by guidance and by policy and by regulation, uh, that site was, was carefully scrutinized and closed. Uh, I understand the concern. It was, it was concern that we as uh, um, the Department of Public Health and Environment have, and those concerns were, were addressed so that we were party to the, the closing of that site. Uh, just real quickly, when I uh, discussed this briefly with others in, the, uh, in our department, including our radon control program, they said, well, you know, the, the greater risk out there, much greater than plutonium uh, at, at those levels is, is radon. And so I promised to just quickly make a plug for that. We, uh, second only to uh, cigarette smoking, radon is a, uh, the leading cause of lung cancer in this country, and particularly here in Colorado. And so we, we have a program to make people aware of that. Uh, there is a real danger to, uh, in addition to the, the natural radiation that we get uh, and the higher amounts we get by living here in Colorado, one of those dangers is, is one that we can control. And uh, so I promise to make you aware of uh, the department's offer to, for free radon test kits. If anyone wants one, uh, I have a coupon here for a free radon test kit. Uh, be glad to, to give that to anyone, anyone here. Thank you. Neil? How much time do I have? <laughs> Ask them. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, I, I think uh, uh, testing radon in your house is very, very important. Um, I'm in the midst of doing it right now. Um, and, um, and, you know, if, you, if your neighbor has none, it doesn't mean you don't have any. I tested it in a townhome uh, with adjoining walls, and mine had a level of 10 picocuries per liter, and my neighbor had one. So it depends upon what little piece of uranium you're sitting on and how many cracks are in your foundation. So, uh, and don't smoke inside the room. It just, uh, it's synergistic. Um, so if you're going to smoke, smoke outside. <laughs> um, I guess uh, the, the, your comment about um, it's too bad that uh, little citizens, even those that are tall, have to get involved in doing this, their own testing, although I think maybe that's the answer. Um, and that um, I wanted, uh, I'm going to try to do this really quickly, tell a story. Um, there's um, a, an author by the name of Timothy Ferris who wrote, uh, writes wonderful stuff about science. Um, he wrote a book called um, The Science of Liberty. And his thesis, which he defends with great uh, amount of evidence, is that the Enlightenment arose out of science and democracy arose out of science. Science came first. Um, and that uh, he went on to um, re you know, report an, an experiment done in 1906 where this polymath by the name of John Galton was at a London fair. And they had, uh, for sixpence, you could um, buy an opportunity to guess the weight of a gourd of a butchered ox, and whoever came closest would take it home. And there were about 800 uh, entries. Um, no one person came really close, but the average came within less than 0.1%. So out of a, a weight of 1,198 pounds, the average of all these 800 guesses was 1,197. Um, the conclusion that he draws, and of course I think it requires a little bit of um, further thought, that the answer for any of these questions that we have is not 
determined by whoever is most educated or whoever has a stake in it. It is determined by everybody. And that uh, diversity, you know, maybe it isn't just lip service that we need to give to diversity. Maybe diversity is the one thing that will lead us to the proper answer. Um, and so I'm doing an experiment in my classes with a jar of popcorn kernels to see if I can replicate this result. But um, that the opinion of everybody, and not just those who know about plutonium, is important. And I think that that's what we've missed um, in uh, this whole thing. Uh, we miss it everywhere in the world, frankly. Um, and that uh, there was, um, let's see, I lost my train of thought. I had one more thing to say. Um, at any rate, uh, I think probably I'll end there. <laughs> <laughs> David. Well, I just want to uh, again thank the Arvada Center for hosting this venue, this, this forum this weekend. Um, it's clear the history of Rocky Flats is a history that's ongoing. And there was a um, uh, Lisa Morzell, who's on Boulder City Council sometime in the last year, asked me, well, what if there's new information? What if there's new data? What if things change over time? And we know that stuff does change over time, science advances. Um, I, I tend to think of Rocky Flats as an editor of process. And um, the one thing we know is that local governments are gonna stay engaged. You know, there's, there's a lot of people here who have been engaged for a while, but there's a lot of new people who are starting to emerge. And we know that um, the one thing that won't change is the involvement, or the one thing that won't change is um, local governments being around, at least in not the foreseeable future. And um, I have confidence that the local governments will stay engaged on these issues as we press forward. All right. I, I, I yes. My last oh, okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the what's interesting to me is I, I in all of this discussion we've never asked the question um, how do we assess the risk and do we what confidence do we have in our ability to do that. Um, and I would just want to say that, uh, you know, we don't know enough to say how dangerous plutonium is. So all these risk estimates are based on an assumption that is still ongoing in the research. Um, so I just want to put that out. Also, we don't understand cancer. I mean, yeah, we understand a lot about it. Um, but, uh, you know, don't presume that we are done uh, understanding this and that who knows in the future uh, what we will go look back upon and uh, assess, well, they got it wrong back then, here's the right answer. Um, maybe, uh, you know, maybe we're being uh, too protective or uh, maybe we're not being protective enough. So I know Ed Martell said that the plutonium standards were anywhere from 500 to 1,000 times uh, too high and not protective. So the opinion is still wide ranging and um, I would just say that uh, in the interest of uh, the future is, is that we should be conservative, even though we, we, you know, fundamentally we think we know what we're doing, but maybe we don't, and we ought to keep that in mind. Well, one, one segue from that is just to say, you know, in terms of overall approach, you know, many countries in dealing with environmental issues and toxicity have what's called the precautionary principle. Um, unfortunately, in this country, we seem to have the principle of, uh, I think John referred to it yesterday as capitalism, um, where you, know, you, you do things until you find something that has gone wrong. And uh, you know, the precautionary principle, I, I think, is something that we should uh, pay more attention to. Um, and finally, in closing, this is, uh, the last event of, uh, of two days and, uh, and a night. Uh, the night was uh, the actual June 6th anniversary of the uh, FBI EPA raid on Rocky Flats. And I really want to commend uh, Philip Sneed, who's the executive director of the Arvada Center, for um, uh, some, some months ago, um, he uh, was, was reading about the, uh, the raid and somehow figured out that it was the 25th anniversary coming up, you know, this month. Now, most people, when you, when you read, you know, 25 is not a number that you typically 
say, ah, 1989, 25 and 1989 is 2014. I mean, we're good with 10th anniversaries and 50th anniversaries and 100th anniversaries. So, uh, so Philip uh, was very creative in doing that. So I uh, um, applaud him for that. And it has been a real privilege for me to, um, to work with these panelists and um, the moderators and, and other panelists and particularly the, uh, the staff of the Arvada Center, uh, which has been uh, really terrific on this, as well as the uh, staff and, and volunteers of the um, Rocky Flats Institute and Museum. Uh, Larry Borowski, who is the, the curator, did a marvelous job of putting together the exhibition downstairs. If you haven't seen it, uh, please look at it and then come back. Uh, it will be... Uh, open until the last date I saw on the program was August 22nd. Um, I think that's great. It would be too bad. It's too bad that uh, it can't be continued uh, um, into, the, uh, into a longer term uh, future. Um, because, you know, this is part of, uh, of Arvada's story. Rocky Flats is part of Arvada's story. It's part of the national story. It's part of the global story. Um, and as I mentioned uh, Friday night, you know, we're still dealing with a world of, you know, 17,000 nuclear weapons with the explosive energy of more than 100,000 Hiroshima bombs. So there are local issues to deal with and conversations to be had, but I hope that the conversations as they continue in the, in the future um, will also remember the, the global issues that we need to deal with. And with that, please give a round of applause for our participants.